The ing form of the verb in English works in two different ways. One is as a participle telling us what someone or something is doing or was doing, will be doing and so on. This is usually called the present participle as opposed to the past participle which ends in ed in regular verbs and is sometimes called the fourth form of the verb. So a verb like love has four forms, love, loving, loved, loved, mm, along with loves, <laughs> so really five. Uh, in any case, in regular verbs, the third and fourth forms are the same, loved, loved. But in some irregular verbs, such as eat or give, the third and fourth forms are different. But that's all a different story. What I'm talking about here is the present participle, which always ends in ing. The other way of using the ing form of the verb is as a gerund, sometimes called a gerund participle, and that is, as the noun form of the verb. At that level, the difference between the two ways of using ing after a verb is fairly simple. The present participle is usually preceded by some form of the verb to be and tells us about an activity in a given time frame. The gerund also talks about an activity, but is not constrained within a, a time frame. There are also grammatical tests we can apply to determine whether an ing form is a participle or a gerund. If it's a sentence or clause with the structure subject plus a form of b plus ing, then we can identify the ing component as a participle and a situation in which the ing component functions as the subject or object of a verb tells us that the ing component is a gerund. One way of testing that is to see whether the ing component can be replaced by a noun. it can be a little tricky. For example, the following sentences seem fairly similar, but in one of them the ing component is a participle, while in the other it's a gerund. Swimming in the sea, Mary felt happy for the first time in years. Swimming in the sea made Mary feel happy for the first time in years. Can you work out which is which? That's right, in the first sentence, swimming in the sea is something Mary was doing, and at the same time as doing it, she felt happy. Swimming is a participle in this sentence. In the second sentence, swimming in the sea is the subject of the verb, it's what makes Mary happy. In this case, swimming is a gerund. To test it, Try replacing the phrase swimming in the sea with something you know is a noun. For example, yoga. Yoga as a noun works as a replacement for swimming in the sea in the second sentence, but not in the first. So we know swimming is a gerund in the second sentence and a participle in the first sentence. We can also see a small difference in the punctuation. The comma in the first example tells us that swimming in the sea is something that Mary was doing, while the lack of a comma in the second example tells us that swimming in the sea is the subject of the verb. Remember, we don't put a single comma between the subject and the verb in English. Another useful tip is if the ing form comes after a preposition. Prepositions are tricky things in English, but the basic idea of a preposition is that it comes before a noun. So if we see the ing form after a preposition, then we can say it's a gerund, not a participle. Uh, just in passing, 
a question that often comes up is why we say, for example, I want to go with the infinitive, but I look forward to going with the ing form of the verb. And the short answer to that one is that in the first case, to is the particle of the infinitive, whereas in the second case, it's a preposition. So it's followed, as I have said, by a gerund. But how do we know? Well, again, the noun test is useful here. We know that the gerund is the noun form of the verb, so we should be able to replace the ing element with a noun. I look forward to going on holiday. I look forward to the summer holiday. Yes, this too can be followed by a regular noun, so we know that it's a preposition here and not the particle of the infinitive. So that covers the basic difference between the participle ing and the gerund ing. The next and perhaps more difficult question is how we can tell whether ing is a gerund or a participle when it's used to modify a noun, such as a crying baby or a swimming pool. And that's the topic of the next video. But does it really matter? There are also some constructions such as go plus ing, as in go shopping, go swimming and so on, that are not easily pigeonholed. Traditionally, this was considered to be a gerund construction, but the noun test doesn't work here and some grammar books and websites will define them as present participles. That raises the question, does it matter? Is there any practical benefit to knowing whether a given case of an ing form of the verb is a gerund or a present participle? That's a tricky one. Most native speakers would have no idea. They simply use the language as they learned it as children without grammar or theoretical concepts of that kind. Even some grammarians have abandoned the idea of talking about participles and gerunds. They simply talk about the ing form of the verb and note its various uses. It's mostly learners of English who approach the language through grammatical rules. But do even they need to know whether a given example of an ing verb is a gerund or a participle? I think the answer to that depends on the type of learner. Some learners like to know the rules and principles of the language they're learning, while for others it's enough simply to accept that that's the way people speak. I do think we should try not to make things difficult for that second type of learner. It's fine to teach the grammar, but we should avoid tests that focus simply on whether students understand the grammar and ignore their ability to use the language in real life situations. But again, that's a topic for another video, or another series of videos.